Bonsoir et bienvenue. Hello and welcome. Mon nom est Ingrid Bachmann. Je suis la directrice du programme de maîtrise dans le département des arts plastiques à l'Université Concordia. Il me fait énormément plaisir de vous accueillir ce soir pour l'événement dans la série d'artistes invités, Conversation en art contemporain. Ce soir, c'est la dernière conférence pour 2014. J'espère vous compter parmi nous pour les prochaines conférences en 2015. Hi, my name is Ingrid Bachmann. I'm the Graduate Program Director in the MFA Studio Arts, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Conversations in Contemporary Arts series. It's a bi-monthly series sponsored by the MFA Studio Arts Program. Tonight is the last lecture for 2014, and we hope you'll join us in 2015 for the next series. Tonight's lecture is special in many ways, not only for our distinguished guest, but also that it's the Marianne Beckett Baxter Memorial Lecture, and we thank the Marianne Beckett Baxter Fund and the family for their generous support. Tonight is also special in that we are collaborating for the first time, and hopefully not the last time, with the Montreal International Documentary Festival. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite Marie-Laure Titli, who is the programming coordinator of our IDM, to introduce our speaker, James Benning. Good evening. Um, my name is Marilal. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, uh, we're very pleased uh, at RADM this year to be organizing a retrospective um, paying tribute to uh, James Benning, James Benning's body of work. Um, so I'd like to thank the uh, MFA Studio Arts, first of all, uh, for collaborating on this event with us. Um, I'd like to mention um, that in addition to tonight's talk, um, we have um, a few other activities uh, as part of this retrospective. So obviously uh, screenings, um, some of uh, a selection of James' work um, will be screening at the Cinémathèque Québécoise. Uh, the first one is uh, happening tonight, so make sure to join us for that. It's at nine o'clock. Um, and uh, there will be an opening of um, an exhibition at uh, Vox Galerie uh, this Saturday at uh, 3 p.m. of two of James' uh, installations. It's free and open to all, so please join us for that. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll stop right there and invite James. Thank you. Oh, nice turnout, thank you. I'm gonna show you a film first. <laughs> start again. As you'll see it, it'll become an anti-tech lecture by the end.
Uh, I grew up there. Uh, that's an excerpt from a film I made in uh, the late 90s uh, called Four Corners. Uh, and I, a fourth of the film takes place in my hometown of Milwaukee. Um, when I grew up there, it was a lower middle class, mainly working class neighborhood, uh, German, all German. Uh, um, adjacent to the black ghetto, and I grew up in uh, extreme prejudice against black people, and black people uh, had the same kind of hatred for us. Uh, it was poor whites being uh, played against poor blacks, um, and there was no analysis of poverty, um, so all of the things that were expected to happen happened. That is the neighborhood eventually became all black and the real estate values went down, uh, not because black people moved in, but because white people were afraid of black people. Um, and as a, a young kid, I uh, t had to negotiate that kind of prejudice. Um, so that's kind of where I started. Um, I wanna show you uh, Milwaukee today. That's my email. Um, you recognize that. Get rid of those borders between you and I. That's a baseball field that I played on when I was a kid. This is my house. Now, interestingly, if I go back one, that's my house. And these are all the new houses that have been built since. But the lower and street level still is before those uh, houses were built. Um, this was probably about five years ago. My house remained, the house next to it, the house next to it, and the next three houses were missing, so it kind of looked like I grew up in the countryside. Uh, and it looks kind of idyllic, but if you go in closer, you see the bars on the windows. That's my bedroom window. Um, today, the, as I showed you, one more, uh, 
you can see all the new roofs, so the houses have been re replenished. So Milwaukee is actually trying to do something with this part of the neighborhood, but not until a lot of the uh, poor people were moved away and uh, uh, kind of the neighborhood was gutted. So now, since it's close to the downtown area, which is right here, it's very valuable property again. Um, but I haven't lived there since the 1970s, or 60s, really. Um, in 2001, I bought a house in the Sierra Nevada. See if I can find it. Yeah, that's it right there. And I can prove it. Because my truck's in the driveway. <laughs> Take a picture of it. Don't be fooled, it doesn't have a shutter. Um, um, so yeah, in uh, 2001 I bought this house. I can show you a better picture of it. That's it. Um, and when I bought it, it was in perfect shape, and really I didn't have to do anything to it, but I ended up tearing it all apart. I put a room down below here, added these three windows. There wasn't a porch below, there was just a porch on top, so I added this porch. I changed this window, and I put in two windows on the side, and I fixed my bathroom, and I uh, tore all the paneling off, and I did sheet rock. So it took about nine months of remodeling uh, uh, to work on this house. And then when I was done, I thought, well, what can I do up here? It's, uh, it's kind of isolated, and, and I was kind of looking for a place to hide away. And so the first thing I thought of doing was to uh, uh, do paintings and to teach myself how to paint. And I was a great admirer of uh, Bill Trailer. Um, uh, that's Bill there. Um, he, he was born a slave in the uh, 1850s, and when he was freed, he sit, stayed on the plantation that he was a slave at and worked there until he was 85 years old. And in uh, the early uh, 1930s, during the Depression, <coughs> he outlived his masters and moved into Montgomery, Alabama as somebody that was hardworking uh, all his life and uh, had no money whatsoever. So he lived on the streets of Montgomery. And from, for three years from uh, 19, uh, well, this isn't a very good site. Um, from 1939 to 1942, he, uh, he painted about uh, 2,000 pictures, uh, some from memory and, and some from uh, what he saw 
on the street, and he ended up doing a chronicle of his life. Um, what I liked about him is that he used found materials. Uh, and he would place it on, on the page in such a way, working with this kind of negative space. So when I started to do his paintings, copying them, if I didn't do them exactly, exactly the way he did, they, never, they didn't have the power that he had. So it, it made me think about my own framing and the way I, I look through a camera and how I use negative space. So I learned very much from doing uh, his paintings. And then, <clears throat> After about nine months of doing his paintings, I did about 200. I wanted to become as obsessive as he was because I was also interested in learning about my own obsession and I thought if I would do a, an obsession of some other person, it would, it would speak to me. Um, but after doing that for about nine months, I wanted to do um, some construction again because I uh, got addicted when I remodeled my house. And so I thought I'd build a house on my property. And then I realized uh, quite early that that was rather ridiculous. I was too old to be building a house. So instead I thought I could build a small house. <coughs> and uh, what came to mind was uh, Henry David Thoreau's uh, cabin at Walden Pond. Um, I had reread uh, Walden when I was teaching in, in Korea in the late 90s. It was the only English book in their library, one of the only English books in their library. And I was very uh, taken by it, um, especially this first paragraph from uh, chapter four. But while we are confined to books, though the most select and classic and read only particular written languages, which are themselves but dialects and provincial, we are in danger of forgetting the language which all things and events speak without metaphor, which alone is copious and standard. Much is published, but little printed. The rays which stream through the shutter will be no longer remembered when the shutter is wholly removed. No matter, no method <coughs> nor discipline can supersede the necessity of being forever on the alert. What is the course of history or philosophy or poetry, no matter how well selected or the best society or the most admirable routine of life compared with the discipline of looking always at what is to be seen? Will you be a reader, a student merely, or a seer? Read your face, see what is before you, and walk into futurity. Um, this particular paragraph became kind of uh, clarifying uh, philosophy of mine that it's important to pay attention and to look and listen. And after <coughs> rereading Walden, I started to teach a course at CalArts called Looking and Listening, where I would take 12 students and we would spend the day uh, going to places uh, by ourselves. We would split up so people wouldn't talk to each other and then purely uh, just uh, pay attention and then reassemble and, and talk about uh, that practice of paying attention. And what I found was my students uh, who took that course, that their work uh, completely became much more subtle after it and I thought uh, uh, kind of made uh, leaps and bounds in the progress of what they were working at. So I think this is a quite a, a remarkable uh, paragraph. Uh, um, the other thing in here, let's see, uh, where is economy D? Uh, uh, so this is the Walden cabin. There are no photographs of Thoreau's cabin. Um, he, he lived there two years, uh, two months and two days, and he, he wrote Walden while he was there. Um, and, but it didn't get published till 10 years later. Uh, but he has a great description of the cabin in this chapter of economy. Uh, and it gives the exact size, 10 feet, 15 feet long, eight foot posts. Uh, and, but what I really like is that he uh, did an accounting of what it cost him to build the, the cabin. 
and these are the materials, and it totals $28, 12 and a half cents, which is quite wonderful. Um, he borrowed an ax, and he uh, was very frugal. Uh, of course, $28 is worth more today, I guess, in our, today's money it would cost more. Uh, this is the, the uh, cabin that was, that's the replica of what the people who run uh, the park at Walden uh, think it would have looked like, and it's probably pretty close because the description of the cabin uh, uh, is, is, is quite uh, elaborate in Walden. Um, I, when I built it, I didn't want to make, at the time I wasn't thinking of it as a complete replica, but I did use the exact dimensions and kind of the form of the cabin, and this is mine that <laughs> exists uh, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains at about 4,000 feet, uh, it, right at the snow level, basically. Um, I used, uh, I bought very expensive designer windows and I didn't use wood shingles on the roof because of uh, problems of fire in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, but it, it uh, at the, uh, built a chimney like his, uh, a fireplace inside, et cetera. And then I started to uh, um, put in paintings. I had also, also uh, started to do other painters. Do I have paintings in here somewhere? Look. Paintings. You see paintings? Test type closer. Yeah, oh, maybe down here they are. Um, <coughs> I, the, this is a trailer painting of one of my trailer paintings that hangs in uh, the Thoreau cabin. And then I also did Mose Tolliver. Uh, was Tolliver uh, was also a black artist from Montgomery, Alabama, and, and uh, was a hardworking man. Also had 12 children uh, and started to paint in his late 60s after he had a, an industrial accident where some um, marble uh, fell on his legs and crippled him. And he became uh, quite uh, depressed after that um, uh, accident and he began drinking and became somewhat of an alcoholic and then one day he just started painting he quit drinking and he changed his life completely around and he too uh, 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 painted from uh, things that he remembered and saw and this is one of his self-portraits this is my copy of one of his self-portraits and then I also did Henry Darger you might know of him he, he was uh, also an outsider artist that wrote a 30,000-page thir novel about the Vivian girls, and this is the Vivian girls fighting against child slavery. He wrote this, his own history and his own kind of uh, hideaway world that he stayed in for 75 years, um, and quite a remarkable artist. And then I also did uh, Martin Ramirez, uh, who was a Mexican artist who came to the States and uh, was arrested in San Francisco and jailed, and he started to refuse to talk, so he was put into a men mental institution where he stayed for 30 years, and he did hundreds and hundreds of drawings like this where he made his own paper, uh, these amazing kind of uh, uh, landscapes. Um, so once I put those... Uh, into the cabin, um, I thought, well, now it's not just playing around with learning how to paint and about obsession. Well, it still was about obsession. Um, but it started to speak to me as, as an art project. And then I thought, well, no, it's too cute. It needs some kind of counterpoint. So I thought, oh, what it needs is a second cabin. So I built the second cabin. Uh, and this is the second cabin. Um, it's uh, an exact replica of uh, uh, Ted Kaczynski's cabin in Montana. 
uh, Ted Kaczynski uh, is known as the Unabomber and arrested in 1995 when his brother uh, recognized his writing that was published in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, he wrote, uh, uh, I don't know, a large, a large manifesto that they printed because he claimed he would stop killing people. He was sending uh, letter bombs through the mail and by 1995 it killed three people. Uh, he was uh, educated at Harvard. He taught at uh, Berkeley for three years. Uh, in the math department, his, uh, his uh, dissertation at the University of, of Michigan won the highest reward of, for mathematics dissertations in uh, the late 1960s. Uh, he was somewhat of a math genius. Uh, while at Harvard, he was... Um, uh, part of a study by Dr. Henry Murray. Uh, Henry Murray uh, worked for the CIA where he was doing stress tests on people to see if he could break down ego. And um, he chose Kaczynski because Kaczynski entered Harvard at the age of 15 and he came from a very poor family in Chicago, very much uh, the same status as my own family. Um, so he was, uh, unlike most of the other Harvard students, he was poor and much younger, and he made a, a, a perfect uh, case study for Murray. Murray named him Lawful in his study. Uh, there's a book by Chase about uh, Harvard and the making of the Unabomber, which is quite interesting. Um, so I, I built this, and then I... I uh, put in more paintings by, uh, this is Jesse Howard, a, a Missouri farmer who uh, put thousands of uh, signs on his property. He called it Sorehead Hill. Um, this one is about uh, somebody wanting a fallout shelter and this is in the Kaczynski cabin because Kaczynski wrote a letter to the government asking how to construct a fallout shelter. Um, and he was interested in having one, not because he thought there might be a, a nuclear problem in uh, the center of uh, Montana, but he really wanted to participate after a nuclear uh, attack that might render the country back to hunting and gathering, something that he thought is maybe the direction we should go in um, once he considered what the evils of technology were. Um, the, when he was arrested, the newspaper uh, pretty much made him into uh, the typical boogeyman that one wants to have when somebody does something uh, criminal like he did, because then we don't have to really understand uh, what happened to him. But uh, actually, I, I'm very fond of a lot of his uh, anti-tech writing, and I think uh, he, he warns us uh, about uh, many important things. Um, I'll just show you three other. This is uh, William Hawkins. He was a, a, a painter from Columbus, Ohio. He started painting in his 40s. Uh, he was kind of a handyman. Uh, and this is Joseph Yoakum. Uh, he was a Chicago painter and he in, very much influenced uh, the Chicago painters like Jim Nutt. Um, they, uh, they're uh, they um, ballpoint and watercolor, and they're these uh, sexualized kind of landscapes that are quite amazing. And this is the last painting that's in the Kaczynski cabin. Uh, it's uh, from the um, Plains Indian drawings that were done on leisure paper. Uh, and this is by Black Hawk, who did a, a number of those drawings. As uh, He would uh, hallucinate, uh, fast and hallucinate, and then he would paint what he, he saw in his hallucinations. Uh, so at this point, uh, oh wait, maybe I should show you. Yeah, I, um, let me do this. Uh, 
Uh, Richard Barnes is a photographer who was commissioned by the New York Times after Kaczynski was arrested to photograph uh, the, uh, Kaczynski's cabin. Uh, Kaczynski's cabin was removed from uh, his property in Montana and dri driven to Sacramento. This isn't a Chelsea gallery, it's actually FBI holding uh, uh, pen in, in Sacramento. Uh, this is uh, where the cabin was before in Montana. That's the FBI uh, fence around where the cabin existed. And then Richard Barnes was able to do these uh, uh, photos with back, black backdrop paper. Uh, so I was able to completely uh, scale the, the, the building by here's a piece of four by eight sheet of plywood. So from that I could get the exact dimensions. And, and the interesting thing about the construction on this side, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven rafters. That's the back. And this side, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so that the rafters didn't meet. They met like this rather than like typical uh, construction. And what that allowed him to do is on this side, I believe, to put three sheets of plywood. And then on the other side, he put two full sheets like this, and then a half sheet and a half sheet. And what I found when I constructed my cabin using the same principles was that it lessened the amount of torque on the roof and made the roof stronger. Um, so I thought it was kind of an interesting that he, because Kaczynski himself was also uh, self-taught about uh, living on his own in the wilderness uh, and his uh, journals uh, very much uh, express what he learned and what his, his uh, desire to, uh, to uh, construct a complete autonomy for himself. Um, and here's, here's a picture of the, uh, the Barnes uh, photographing uh, it with the black backdrop and then they could turn it. And I, I had just found this photograph. I didn't realize that the whole event was a big media circus, it looks like. Look at all those cameras. Crazy documentary. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, the, the project keeps growing. Um, I, um, well, let, yeah, let me talk about this too. Uh, when, I, when I made the second cabin as a counterpoint, I was about halfway finished uh, doing the Kaczynski cabin when I realized that I had done the same solution before. And that is uh, with my film, American Dreams, which actually plays later tonight at nine o'clock. Um, I made a film in, the 18, in 1984 that uh, uses all the uh, baseball cards of Henry Aaron. Um, my daughter was interested in, in baseball as a young child, so we went to a lot of baseball card conventions, and then I got obsessive, and I wanted to collect all of Henry Aaron's baseball cards because I was a big baseball fan when I was younger, and then I also um, uh, liked the idea of, of uh, reliving my past by collecting these cards, so I actually went ahead and, and purchased all of uh, Henry Aaron's cars. He played baseball from uh, 1954 uh, uh, to 1975, which were the coming of age years for myself. So this particular film, American Dreams, which uses all his cards, covers those years. Um, when I I show all the fronts of the cards first. Uh, so in 1954, you see there's only two cards for 1954. So you see the first, the fronts of the two cards, and then you see the backs of the two cards. And each year is represented by 100 feet of film, approximately two and a half minutes. 
So the fronts would be on for a minute and a quarter and the backs would be on for a minute and a quarter. And when you would see the fronts of the cards, you would hear a political speech from that year. And then when you would uh, see the backs of the cards, I would play some popular music from that year. So as the film advances from 54 to 55 to 56, all the way to 75, you go through a series of political speeches and a series of popular culture uh, music. And when I got to that point, I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting film, but it also needed a counterpoint. Uh, just like later, so many years later, I used the counterpoint with the um, Kaczynski cabin with Thoreau. I decided I would um, put a, uh, a diary text that's animated through the bottom of the film. And I chose a, a diary text by uh, Arthur Bremer uh, who is from Milwaukee, a little younger than me. He grew up on Milwaukee South Side, which is, was the Polish part of town. He also grew up in a working class neighborhood like mine. Um, he became infamous in 1972 when he first stalked uh, Richard Nixon and tried to kill Nixon. And he ended up shooting George Wallace, who was running for president in 72, crippling Wallace, not killing him. Uh, Wallace uh, had bec was a, um, the uh, governor of Alabama for many years, and he was a known racist uh, and uh, somewhat of a demagogue. And then after he was shot, uh, he had a reversal, and later he was voted in again as governor of Alabama with a complete... Uh, support of the black community because of the way he had changed. Uh, he wrote to Arthur Bremer many times, telling him he was forgiving Bremer for shooting him, and Bremer never answered. Um, Bremer was released from jail three years ago. He's the only uh, would-be assassin uh, ever to uh, shoot a presidential candidate and serve his term and get out of prison. Um, maybe I can show you uh, the te some of the text from that. This is the script for American Dreams, written after the film was made, of course. Uh, uh, 1954, there's the two baseball cards. This is the, the amount of uh, text from um, Arthur Bremer that goes through the bottom. That year you hear Senator Joseph McCarthy, Army McCarthy hearings, and you hear the Johnny Ray singing cry. The next uh, year you hear RCA Victor advertisement for color television, and you hear Dungry Doll by Eddie Fisher. The next one's Elvis Presley telephone interview, and you hear Rock With Me Henry by Etta James, and uh, Eisenhower speech, and et cetera. Uh, let me go, there's also Malcolm X, uh, Father James Grappi, who was a, um, uh, a, a priest in an all black um, congregation uh, just near where I lived. And at the age of 16 and 17, when I was going through this conflict, with uh, the kind of racism that I grew up with. I started to visit that church to uh, become part of meetings with uh, uh, Grappi and other b young black people, and I became part of the black movement for a few years. Um, there's a speech by King, Neil Armstrong. Etc. What uh, maybe I can read you a little bit of. Of uh, let me go back to. Okay, uh, I'll read a little of. Uh, okay, we'll get continental. This is a little of the Bremer uh, diary that 
took me a month to, uh, it's handwritten and then it was animated through the bottom of the frame, so it took me a month to animate that through one frame at a time, click, move, click, move, click, move. <coughs> okay. I really felt good being stared at by poor people, checked into the Waldorf. Diana Ross was there as a performer. I didn't want to see her because I felt she had watered down her talents for the rich whites. After three days in New York, I decided to go to a massage parlor. I look up their ratings and screw newspaper. I couldn't do it. I walked past the place. I felt like it was going to going to get raped, went into an adult bookstore to try to get a horny feeling, lousy, boring fuck books, and the good photo magazines were wrapped in cellophane, fuck them. I had to think things through and get relaxed and this and that and the other. Now, somehow I walked up the squeaky, that's his spelling, stairs into the place on the second floor and I uh, picked out the blonde, the best looking, I thought. She led me into a room, locked it, turned the lights out, lit incest all with her back generally towards me. Piped in music began. I handed her three tens and said we'd have to take it easy. I just ate lunch. <laughs> she began to undress. I took off my vested business suit and overcoat and laid on my stomach on the massage table, nude. She didn't see my organ yet. She started by massaging the fleshy part above and behind my collarbones, then the upper back, lower back, buttocks, and legs. She was completely nude except for a yellow uh, neon, neon <laughs> nylon uh, bikini uh, panty. I was, uh, she saw I was looking at her private part. She talked about the rules. Customers aren't allowed to touch the girls. By the time she was massaging my penis with one hand up and down too quickly to enjoy it, I moved her hand in mine in a slower, more uh, pleasurable mo motion. I sat up gently and tried to put my head on her breast, and she stepped back and just out of range. We looked at each other. Uh, a long time she was here only for the money and knew she could make more by fucking but but wouldn't whatever she was whenever she was close I held her more private parts and she did not protest I felt sorry for the kid she was just like everybody else it was it was a job and she was only in it for the money I sat up for the last time I'm sorry she smiled and I said okay uh, earlier, I had told her that she could pull and push on that thing for a week. I, could, I couldn't come. It was true. I needed, I wanted. I was preparing for a wild one half hour of sucking and fucking and tonguing and everything. Just looking at bear ticks, no matter, uh, and getting a hand. I'll stop there. You can see the film later. <laughs> you can see the film later tonight. Um, um, the, the, when I went to uh, write the Bremer text, I was going to make up uh, the, uh, the, his diary, and so I started to do research at the Milwaukee uh, County Library, and in the first hour I found that he already had had a diary and that he had uh, um, published that diary, so my job was made rather easy. At that point, I just had to edit it down that it would fit into a 60-minute film, which, which I did. Um, there was a, also a second diary that he had that's referred to in the first diary that had never been found, and uh, about 15 years ago, it was found uh, when they were raising a building in the Industrial Valley of Milwaukee, a construction worker found the second diary hidden inside of a wall. And then there was a, a court case to fight for who owned the diary, Bremer or this person who found it, and the judge ruled in favor of the construction worker. And then he immediately uh, auctioned it off uh, through a New York auction house, and, they, and it, it, uh, I think it sold for uh, at that time, I think it was uh, actually in the late 80s when this happened, it sold for $5,000 and the auction house said, well, we could have got a lot more if he would have killed them. So that's uh, capitalism. Uh, all right, so um, 
now I have this, uh, these two cabins in the mountains. Um, uh, they throw in the Kaczynski cabin. Uh, and I'm f thinking, well, I have a fairly interesting art project. It's, it's taken two years to get to this point. And I'm thinking, well, how can I uh, now show this? I'm not sure I want a lot of people coming to visit me, although you're all invited. If you, if you can find it, I showed you where it was. I, I'll show you again. Uh, uh, this is the, this is the uh, Thoreau cabin, and this is the Kaczynski cabin. This is my main house, the front porch. And um, so w when I got to this point and had these two cabins done, uh, then I st I, the project really wasn't finished because the next thing I did is I put a library into uh, the Kaczynski cabin uh, with uh, 120 books, half of them from my library and half of them from the library that was found in Kaczynski's cabin when he was arrested. <coughs> Um, and then I built uh, tables and ch chairs and uh, beds in for both of them to somewhat domesticate it. I also made uh, quilts uh, modeled after the G's Bend Quilt Makers, uh, which is a black quilting collective of um, African-American women in uh, Alabama on the G's Bend, uh, the bend of the G's River, uh, they, where they were remained uh, um, isolated, um, f uh, physically isolated by the river. So their African culture, they came as slaves and they remained in that same place and kept all of their uh, African heritage with them. And their quilts are very much based on African designs and quite, quite remarkable. A few years ago, they uh, had a show of uh, G's Bend quilts. As it started at the uh, museum in uh, um, Texas. Uh, which city was it? Uh, well, anyway, and then it moved on to the, to the Whitney and a, a number of other museums. And they, uh, a few years later, they, they were on, also on U.S. postage stamps. So the, um, they, those women also became very politically motivated in the 60s during the, the black uh, movement. Uh, and they were, uh, Martin Luther King came to G's Bend and then they became uh, a quilt, uh, made a, uh, a collective where they were selling quilts to add money to the civil rights causes. So they were very political women. And I, so I thought that was interesting for my own background to add those into the, uh, into the cabins with the outsider artists that I've already had. Uh, and then I, um, I made uh, four films that um, go along with this. Maybe I'll play a little of, of uh, the first film that I made was called Two Cabins. Uh, it's a half-hour film. Um, it looks out the two different windows, first 15 minutes out of the uh, Thoreau cabin, and then I'll, we'll look at it a little bit and I'll rush through it.
There's a portion in it where a train goes by. I was trying to find that, but I didn't do it. Uh, uh, there was a train that went by uh, Walden, uh, so it's in reference to that. Bill Walden wrong. Um, yeah, you have to watch the whole film, of course, to, to get the idea, but I'm going to... Uh, and then Stemple Pass uh, is also um, another film that it's a two-hour film it's actually installed at Vox and you can watch the whole film and I'm just gonna show you a little of it it uh, hopefully I shouldn't oh, that's Photoshop it doesn't work there what, what, what if you save it oh, well okay where is it again uh, I'm just gonna show you the first few set oh Jesus Kaczynski's right. It's fucking shit. <laughs> um, okay. Try this one, that one there. They're right next to each other. So that, that's the view off my front porch and the Kaczynski cabins on the side there. I, um, you see this in all four seasons and then you hear me read texts. I'm just gonna go to a little bit of the text. Saying that the elk was having great difficulty with the deep oh, snow that's in That's a the good ravine. one, let's go back. Oh, that's a good one. Cartridge and found him lying by the creek as he showed some disposition to get up on his front legs again, I shot him in the back, the bullet passing out through his chest and making a pretty good hole. Actually, I almost regret shooting him because he was such a beautiful, alert animal, and he was the first coyote I'd ever seen, except from a moving car, which doesn't count. It was quite a job carrying him back to the cabin. He must have weighed 30 pounds or more. I have all the meat stashed away. Some just hung in the cool attic, some packed in snow, and some hung up behind the stove to make jerky. I put the hide on a stretcher made of spruce poles. 
but I still have to clean off the fat bits of meat which still cling to it. Today on my walk, a bull elk moved out of my path and made the mistake of trying to go through a shallow ravine. Noticing that the elk was having great difficulty with the deep snow in the ravine, I thought I would pursue him and see how close I could get. The elk floundered so badly that his progress was extremely slow, and his difficulties were compounded by the fact that in the neighborhood of the ravine were many small trees which grew too close together for him to get his antlers through. As a matter of fact, I was able to snowshoe right up to him. By the time I reached him, he was so exhausted that he just laid panting in the snow. I approached him from the side, put out my hand, and stroked his ribs for several minutes. I'm going to st stop this. Uh, the the um, texts that I'm reading are from journals uh, that he wrote. Uh, I was able to... Um, um, get uh, access to all 25 journals that he wrote from 1970 to 1995. Uh, three years ago, they were auctioned off by the FBI, and a friend of mine who's doing quite well in the art world uh, knew that I wanted him, and he's very good at getting things that he wants. So he, he bought them and uh, uh, allows me to have access to it. So Stemble Pass. Uh, uses mainly uh, texts from those journals, although I do read also from the manifesto and, and a few other things. Um, part of those texts were uh, coded. Uh, whenever he talks about sensitive things, he would uh, uh, write in a numbered code. Uh, and one of the films uh, that spun off of this project is called Data Entry, and I'll show you a little of that.
So I wrote a computer program and I used the 1984 NEC computer to uh, to run the program on uh, since the, the, the most of the stuff that I was decoding came from the early 80s. Um, and then this is a an example of me. Uh, the program that I wrote, it asks you to uh, enter 100 numbers from the A notebook, 100 from the B notebook, and then it kind of does the stuff that it needs to do. Um, the, the code was a, a, almost impossible code to crack, and it's a very simple code, and the FBI couldn't crack it, but uh, then they found uh, hidden in the cabin uh, instructions on how to decode uh, uh, the, and so I also have those instructions, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to encode it. I'll show you some of those. Uh, it's 13 pages of decoding uh, information. Um, so, and then he gives an example, and you follow the example, and here he's showing you how to do it by hand. This is what I made the computer do. And then the, in <laughs> the interesting thing is, this, if you decode his, uh, his example, right, this is the answer, and I won't read that, but you can read that. How can I be sure? Um, and then um, I also made a film called um, Nightfall, which is a, inspired by both Kaczynski and Thoreau and, and the kind of looking and listening that I was doing with my class. Uh, Nightfall is a, a 97, do I have a picture of it here? Stumble Pass, Nightfall. Is it, is it there somewhere? Number 10. Oh, number 10, oh, okay, yeah. It's just a photo. Um, it uh, it's, was shot in the Sierra Nevada above where I live at about 11,000 feet. So it's, uh, and it, it simply looks at this scene for 97 minutes. There's no wind, so it's pretty much like this, but the light changes from late afternoon to complete darkness to a black frame. Uh, and the sound changes from the afternoon sounds to the nighttime sounds of very large, uh, loud crickets. Um, I've shown the film uh, and been at most of the screenings when it showed, and every one has been um, kind of a group Zen experience. It's actually quite an amazing film. I think I'm very ha pleased with this film, but it's p also part of this particular series. And then I've I'm making a sequel right now, or a, a companion film to Stemple Pass called Concord Woods. And it's, it, rather than four shots at four times during the season, it's at the uh, summer solstice, which is this one, and then the other one is winter solstice. Um, and I read text from, not Kaczynski here, but from Thoreau, and, read from Walden for one of the uh, uh, parts, and the other one I read from an essay that uh, Thoreau wrote called uh, in, uh, what is it called? Uh, in Support of uh, Captain John Brown. And Thoreau was a supporter of John Brown. John Brown, of course, uh, uh, invaded the, the uh, national, uh, what are they called, where you keep all your guns uh, in Harper's Ferry, and they was trying to liberate those guns to help start a revolution against slavery. And uh, he was caught and then executed, and, and on the morning that he was executed, hung, 
uh, Thoreau read this essay and supported John Brown because Thoreau uh, was very much against slavery and also against the war in, in Mexico at the time, so he was very political. Uh, some of, uh, uh, also Thoreau and his mother and sister, actually his mother and sister started at first. They ran the uh, very early underground railroads to uh, help fugitive slaves escape to Canada. Uh, um, so they were actually doing things that were uh, quite radical. Um, and Thoreau, of course, is mainly known for his existentialism and his, his pacifism. But uh, he was supporting John Brown and was one of the only intellectuals that continued to uh, uh, support Brown even after Brown was executed. So the, once I started to do a lot of research about Kaczynski and, and Thoreau, they, there was kind of a connection between those two. Um, um, so I, I made these films, but then I also, with Julie Alt, who is the founder of of um, group material in New York, a very political art group in the in the 80s. Uh, she liked my Two Cabins project a lot, and we, um, let me put my glasses on. We produced a book together that she edited. Uh, it's called, uh, well, it's got two names. It's called Two Cabins by James Benning, but it's, its real title is FC Two Cabins by JB. Uh, and this is the, this is the book. It's, it's uh, available through Art Press in New York. Uh, uh, it was designed by Martin Beck. Um, why does it go to the beginning? I don't know. Um, Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, so that's the cover. And then there's uh, a part of Solitude from Henry David Thoreau. And then there's an excerpt on freedom uh, from Kaczynski from his manifesto. And then there's photographs uh, that I took this is the path between the two cabins. Uh, that's, you've seen, that's it in winter. Um, and <clears throat> these are uh, photographs of catalogs of the artists and the works that I copied. Uh, here's that one hanging in the Thoreau cabin, uh, three uh, trailers. That's uh, the same window that you saw, and you notice that it's a designer window and it isn't really a replica of these you've seen. There's the actual one that I copied from the catalog of his work. Uh, that's the fireplace. Other books. There's a fireplace here. You can see two of the paintings on the wall. Uh, here's the <clears throat> the Blackhawk uh, drawing. Um, this is uh, the Kaczynski cabin from the nearby roadway. That's it through the Manzanilla trees. This is a drawing by Kaczynski, um, which is also in the cabin. This is a replica of his drawing. Um, this is one of the uh, books in the library, and I chose to show this one. It's A Boy in a Battery. It was Hollis Frampton's favorite book. Uh, here's a, uh, the, one of the, there's 30, 11 book sh uh, stacks. This is uh, one of them. I, I ordered the books not by category or by author or by um, subject, but rather by size. So all the piles, and, and then they give rather interesting juxtapositions. And um, then there's a description of the paintings that are in here. And here's, here's the library. I thought I'd show you a little. Am I going too long? Are you all right out there? You're still with me? You're still here? 
Um, these are the, the books. If they have a one after them, they were found in Kaczynski's cabin. The other ones are from my library. And sometimes I had a, I had a number of the books that he had because I, I was educated at the same time as he was and the Harvard cu curriculum trickled down to lesser universities like I went to. It's an amazing library. It's, uh, if you come, you can read books. Um, and then I wrote biographies for 12 people, for Thoreau, for Kaczynski, and then all of the outsider artists. And they're, they come next. And then Julie Alt wrote a, an essay, and Dick Hebditch, if you know Dick Hebditch's writing, uh, he's a, a wonderful critical writer. So that's that's the book, and um, and then there's the films, and then this past fall I had a museum show uh, in Graz where lots of this stuff was. Uh, there's an installation, but oh, we we also when I had the museum show. The museum director wanted to move my cabins from the Sierra Nevada mountains to Graz, Austria, and I thought, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, um, and then I said, well, I don't want to make replicas of replicas. So then I said, we could, we could um, make uh, architectural renderings of the cabins, you know, those little white models that you make? Well, we did that, but we made them life-size. Um, so you, they're not here about the materials, but just about the space of themselves. Uh, um, let me show you. This is this was in the show. There, there's the two cabins installation. The film that I just showed you, Two Cabins, is also done as an installation where you, you have the two windows at the same time. And then there's a, a, a replica, the same kind of typewriter that Kaczynski used. And this is the Thoreau desk that uh, exists in, I actually made two of them. So this, is, this installation is owned by somebody, so I made another one because I need it in the cabin. But So there's a... a connection between kind of, and there's some two pencils. Um, Thoreau's family were in the pencil industry, so I was able to find two very expensive pencils to put on this table. Um, well, I'll just show you the birthday card, and then we'll stop and talk. This is, uh, I sent a birthday card to Ted. This is the envelope, of course, I, it's a replica of the envelope because I send him the envelope, I don't have it. But. And then uh, the birthday card. This is the birthday card. It's, this is framed in such a way that there's glass on both sides so you can see the, the front and the back. You could see the envelope on the back and this on the front. And this is kind of a structuralist birthday card that I made, and I'll let you read it. It's, it's about happy birthday to you, how it works for Henry, but it doesn't work for Ted, because you need two syllables, basically. So nevertheless, happy birthday, dear Ted. And there's the notes, and I signed it. And, and, and then he wrote me back. Uh, uh, that's the postcard he wrote to me. It's actually uh, a green pepper, but I thought it was an eggplant. It faded in the sun or something? I don't know. 
and then the postcard is quite wonderful. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? I like how this is all stamps and this is address. And <laughs> it's very funny. Um, yeah. Um, then the data entry as an installation, and then there was a vitrine that had that same decoding that we just saw I did by hand when uh, Dick Hebditch was visiting me up in the mountains in his essay <coughs> that he wrote in the book he wanted to write about my decoding. So I showed him how, what, how the program actually worked by doing it by hand here. This is the program. These are two replicas of the notebooks these two notebooks that are in the film are the actual notebooks. And then this is the Two Cabins book, open to the page where Dick Hebditch is writing about this particular code. Those are the pages that refer to that. So the, all, all this stuff kind of works together. Um, there was also, uh, Stemple Pass was installed similar to what I have at Vox. Um, And then I'll just show you one other piece that was there that, oh no, I think maybe I should show you the typewriter. I didn't show you that earlier, did I? Um, wait, uh, focus the graves. What's the, oh, that's the museum in graves. It's quite spect, I had the whole second floor, it's quite spectacular. Um, I don't see it. Oh, a silk screen. Pascal's Lemma, that's it. Maybe I'll play a little of this and then we'll talk. This was also in the show. It's a piece that I wrote in, in uh, a program in 1984 on that same computer that I've used for the other one. And then I, I um, made a document of that piece. So the 1984 computer is playing inside of a laptop computer here, and the cord goes down here, and then I made a replica of, of Andy Warhol's um, electric chair, so we have two electric chairs kind of together, and uh, I'll show you the replica of the silk screen. Um, it's the same chair that he used, but a different photo but it's Old Sparky, as its nickname was. Um, pardon? The quilt, yes. Um, I'll, I'll show you the, let me show you. Is the quilt on here? 21. You guys know about 23, you lied. Um, it's made from jeans, um, but I, I made another one. I also had the same time as this museum show was going. I had a show at my gallery in, uh, let's see, how do I get to that? In uh, Berlin, Neuger Riemschneider. Um, and I did a, a more elaborate quilt piece there, shows. Um, oh, that, that's the actual G's Ben quilt that I copied, but mine is more, uh, is this? Oh, I wrote a text about uh, a biography of the woman that I copied her quilt. So the, on one wall there was uh, this biography of the woman. And then another wall there was a stained glass replica I made of a, a Mondrian painting. And then across from that was the quilt. 
uh, this quilt that I made uh, that was based on the design of the actual quilt. But this is all with Levi material also, and all hand-stitched. And I love making quilts. I'm going to retire. Um, oh, and then hmm. there was one other one other thing in the museum show. Um, there was a text, a replica text of a journal from Thoreau talking about the railroad that was framed. And then we uh, played my film um, RR, which is uh, a two hour, two hour film. Uh, uh, we put one, one hour reels on. And so there would be a real change and the projector was in the room as kind of a performance. Uh, the reel would be changed every hour and you could watch all of RR at, on one side and then here's a digital projector pointing the other way. And so it was a double projection. Uh, yeah, um, so this is a projector going the other way and this then the digital projection this is a new film, it's a three and a half hour film, one shot of a place in the desert where trains pass by and in the three and a half hours, 13 trains pass by. And on this one, there's 47 trains that happen over the two hours, but every shot is the beginning and end of the train, so you see the full train. Here you see just 13, so there's a lot of waiting time between trains. And it goes from late afternoon to dusk, so the light in the desert changes tremendously. It's not a very good photo of it, but you get the idea. And one other thing, I just will show you this too. This was uh, that text that I read of uh, Thoreau, that paragraph. I silk screened onto newsprint and uh, silk screened 500 of them, so the first 500 people that came by and took one uh, had a a uh, nice little piece of work here that I gave away at the museum. Here's the paintings that were also from my cabins that are in the show. And then this is a, a, uh, one of K Kaczynski's, uh, a page from one of his journals that was made uh, very large on the wall and hand drawn on the wall. Uh, so that's all of that. So, um, it's, so I mean, it's uh, my point of the whole lecture, I guess, is to um, is to show that um, what I'm doing now is my work and my life is, I, I can't really distinguish between my work and my life, so what I do becomes my artwork and that something that didn't begin as an artwork at all but began as kind of something playful with painting and construction grew into a rather elaborate, um, uh, and it's still, it's still of course going and still adding to things, but, but I'm interested in this kind of larger space than um, just what, it, before it would be all contained in one film, but here you can see it's um, many, many different facets that kind of uh, talk about a lot of interesting things I think we should be talking about today, and that, that is about uh, autonomy, because we're losing autonomy so greatly and, uh, with the kind of rules and the corporate thinking that we have. And, um, and so um, I, I really like this piece, so I hope you liked it too. So, okay. Do we, have, Okay. My turn? Yep. <laughs> uh, as you know, uh, you, you jump to the digital uh, format uh, um, not so fast. 
uh, I'm wondering uh, now uh, what kind of movie you will uh, will uh, do in that age, digital age. Well, I mean, I've been making digital films now for five years, so I, it's allowed me to have uh, complete control over the whole process, which I didn't have before. And what drove me from filmmaking is that the process somewhat got out of hand, that lab services weren't reliable and either were projections, so you would take six months to get a good print and t two weeks to ruin it in a bad projector. Uh, and that kind of stress was just uh, too much for me. But I, uh, and I'm kind of glad that I was driven away from it because it made me think in a lot of different terms and uh, 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 gave me a lot more possibilities, basically because I can do three hour shots now where I couldn't do that before. And I don't have to worry about the cost once you have the equipment bought. I now I've been working with the same equipment for five years, so it costs me nothing to make a film anymore. So that's kind of uh, wonderful to be in that position. Of course, this stuff, you know, it it breaks down. It's not going to last uh, for 40 years like my Bolex, and and uh, they keep building in obsolescence that you need to buy new equipment. But I like the image it makes, and I learned how to make an image with it. I know what light my camera uh, likes, and I know I'm not trying to make celluloid images and uh, images that, of that material. I'm trying to make something with pure light now. Um, film doesn't look real at all. It has grain. We never see grain, and none of you look grainy to me. So uh, um, in a sense, it's a much more real uh, uh, um, image. And uh, I mean, it, it has its problems, but uh, it also has a lot of great possibilities, especially in post-production. I can collage things together. If you see uh, small roads, I think that's showing here. Um, I've collaged, that's, the whole film is a lie. You know, every sky is different. And, um, but you, you, it's very subtly done, so it, it's made to look more real than less real. So I like that kind of playfulness that you can have. Uh, hi. Uh, you've, uh, you have not talked about uh, these movies, but uh, I wondered uh, in film like uh, 10 Skies or 20 Cigarettes, how do you uh, choose uh, those numbers? Uh, well, there's 20 uh, cigarettes in a pack. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, and I've been corrected that there's only one sky, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I agree there is only one sky. I mean, in that sense, I had just made 13 lakes, and uh, 13 lakes, uh, I like that number, of, and it, it was a manageable amount, and I thought it was a film that was still shot on 16 millimeter, and it was I could almost afford 13 lakes because uh, it was almost a, what 13 times uh, 130, 130 minutes, right? So that's two hours and 10 minutes, and I thought that's kind of pushing an audience at that point. Uh, although now I don't now I like longer films, but I was working within my means basically with those. And, and both of those films have 10 minute shots because by that time from uh, doing all these uh, ideas about listening, looking, looking, I realized that to learn, it takes time to learn and you can't really know what anything is in two minutes or three minutes. You have to actually look at something for a while. Uh, and I like the idea that my camera is completely disciplined. When I turn it on, it stays and it doesn't look away. It, it can record what I pointed at. And then when I play it in the theater, uh, the other thing I like is that there's a contract with the audience that's very strong, that people are willing to watch something on a screen. Uh, in fact, that contract's stronger than real life because if I took you to the same lake, you would not watch it for 10 minutes. So um, knowing that 
that contract is strong and, and uh, believing that uh, learning is a function of time, I started to do these kinds of works that push kind of the uh, limits of duration because I think duration is important. Hi. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Uh, the first one's kind of more a point of personal curiosity as a cabin person. Um, what actually happened in the, in the two cabins, uh, other than you filming, what actually happens in them? Um, the, in well, they're livable spaces now. They do have beds and, and one can stay in them. Um, my daughter visits me quite often, and she wrote a whole bunch of music in the Thoreau cabin. And people, you know, go down to the Kaczynski cabin and read, and uh, and maybe somebody will sleep there. They generally tend to pick the other one, but uh, <laughs> I myself like the uh, Kaczynski cabin. It's the light in the morning is really special with those small windows. And um, does that stuff bleed into the? work or has it? I'm, I mean, um, the, the, you saw how the work, you know, kind of grew and it's still growing. So any experience I have within those cabins has to somewhat affect what I'm going to do. Maybe not directly, but, you know, it's, it's part of it. The, my own experience in the cabins is very important to me, you know. And I have to maintain them, I have to paint them, I have to clean them, I have, you know. So they're partly uh, um, a burden too, which I like, you know, take care of them. Um, okay, the second part of my question, or my second question, um, it's not even really my question. <laughs> it's a question I copied. Uh, it's when I was in school, in my undergrad, there was this guy, Matt Reed, who attended all of the lectures and he asked the same question uh, at every single one mm -hmm. for four years. <laughs> uh, and so I'll ask you the same question as well. Um, and his question to all the lecturers was, uh, where's the love? Where is to love? <laughs> um, <coughs> I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's an extremely important question because all of this work is really from out, outsider point of view. And uh, a lot of it's about isolation and uh, about outside of kind of society. And maybe that's where some of the problem comes that when you become so disconnected, that there is a lack of love, there's a lack of connection to other people. I myself am in a point in my life where I certainly have a social life because I travel and do things like this and I also teach, but I also have been um, hiding away more because I don't like people anymore. I think we have a, not anybody in particular that I don't like, but. <laughs> I just think we have such a bad track record and uh, what's happening in the world today is just so disgusting to me that, and, and the political solutions just get worse and worse. Uh, so I, I don't want, I, I was getting into a point where the, that question is what, where is love is very important to me and this uh, summer I met a young woman, um, a 25 year old woman who, uh, kind of confronted me a lot about my art practice and what what I was doing she, because she was also very interested in about being isolated, but she's also very interested in community. And so I think she actually asked me that same question, but in different terms. And my uh, solution was uh, to, I just finished making 31 artworks. Uh, there's, there are two films, a bunch of paintings and drawings and um, uh, some sculpture. Uh, and um, I'm giving them the 31 different friends. So I'm trying to reposition my work to answer your question basically uh, uh, and to reconnect to these 31 people that I know. 
And so I've, I've finished the works, I've photographed them. Now I'm writing, I'm writing a text, a, a, a page about each person when I, when I met them and who they are in my life. And then a page about the work that I made that's focused on them. So there's kind of a connection between them and the work. And then next summer I'm gonna have a show of all the work in Marfa, Texas at a, a an old building, a, a, a hardware store and lumber yard that's closed that uh, the bookstore in uh, Marfa has just got a hold of that I could do the show there. And then hopefully some of the people will come there, but then I'll give all the work away. So it's kind of a, a reaction also to become, in the last three or four years, I have a gallery now that's a really blue chip gallery in, in uh, Berlin. and and that you become very aware of the art market and money and all that, and I really don't care about that at this point. But I, I do care about having my work seen, and by having a gallery, it was uh, opened up things that, you know, two years later I have a museum show, and I have never had a museum show, and, and that show is now traveling to Hamburg, and hopefully it's gonna come to the U.S. after that. So there's advantages to the gallery, but my gallery is kind of unusual because I told them I didn't care about making money and they said they don't care either, they just want to support me. So uh, I like that kind, that's where love is, I think, yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, Hello. About 20 years ago, I saw one of your films and at that point I had been a Bob Dylan fan for about 30 years and it has, uh, one of his songs which plays, I believe, twice in its mm -hmm. entirety in the film. And since uh, Bob Dylan showed up twice tonight, I thought maybe I'd ask you what, what you might have to say about Bob Dylan in relation to your work or well, anything. I grew up in a, and you saw the neighborhood I grew up in, I grew up in a family that didn't have books and didn't have art on the wall, so, uh, I had no connection to an outside world or a different kind of world. And I, when I was about 15 or 16, I uh, w would walk to this suburban shopping mall because they had a good record store. And I was, this was in the early, late 50s actually, uh, probably 58. And I was going to buy a new Elvis Presley record, and there was a young wo there was a woman there that I thought was an old woman. Now I'd call her a young woman. She was like in her twenties and had red lipstick. I still remember her. Uh, and she said, "No, no, no, no! Don't, don't buy uh, that Elvis Presley stuff. Come over here." And she uh, gave she showed me a Lambert Hendrickson Ross vocal jazz album. And uh, I brought that home, and uh, it just completely stunned me that the world, that a world like that could exist where people could sing with their voices that sound like instruments. It was ideas that were just so far away from my little bedroom that I played it in, that I kept listening to it over and over, and it really completely changed my life. Uh, I met Annie Ross, uh, in London about 10 years ago when there was a movie about women jazz singers and I told her the story and she cried. It was just like, made me feel so, so wonderful. Anyways, the point of my story is that music was something that was the first thing that spoke to me. And, and when Dylan came out and I heard his first album in the early 61, I saw him and perform in Madison, Wisconsin early. He also did the same thing, as did Patti Smith years later. And uh, So music uh, all along has affected me greatly. Hi, um, about the, uh, the painters that you choose to uh, copy the work of, uh, it seems to me that they are uh, they can be considered outcast or outsiders. Mm -hmm. I think you might have answered my my question uh, uh, earlier on, but um, I was wondering uh, for me the history of those of those person it seems as much important as their work for you and uh, why are you interested interested in only those types of uh, of people like outsiders <coughs> and uh, isolated well, people? 
I'm certainly interested in other artists than that, um, but for this project that seemed to be about myself trying to find my own autonomy and, and on my own place outside of things, that those were the people that were speaking to me directly rather than Jasper Johns or you know somebody like that. Uh, or even um, um, John Cage, who has been a great influence on me. Um, um, this, this was a different language that they were using, and it seemed to be in a language that it was very close to what I was thinking about and the way I was behaving, you know, so, yeah. But, and I'm also interested in them because they, they have been, they were so ghettoized too, because now I think people are seeing that there are a few people anyways are understanding they're really great artists. I mean, there's a lot of really bad folk art. Uh, I don't like, I don't like bad art, I just, you know. But I'm glad people do it because they, they're busy, you know, it keeps them busy and they're thinking differently anyways, sometimes. <laughs> uh, I just, well, I mean, um, in terms of, uh, I've never encountered your work before now, so I have to say this is uh, quite rich t territory. And uh, I, and I was just wondering, instead, um, in terms of like um, how you s you set up the camera through these windows, and you mentioned the bars in your uh, home, uh, mm -hmm. original home, and. And even like how you've presented this presentation with the use of like framing windows mm -hmm. and zooming in and out. Um, how, how do you um, situate or if you do somehow recognize or talk or if there's a conversation with the history of like field recordings? With field, field recordings? Field recordings? W would you consider your work in some ways? Um, well, I think that would be a great compliment because I really, uh, uh, early, really early field recordings of music, uh, uh, Lomax, those recordings are quite amazing. And then just field recordings of sounds and things. Are, uh, I, I think they're very genuine and they, uh, they record something really special. Um, but you said something in the beginning oh, about the windows them, themselves and the, uh, yeah, yeah, I, and I... It's on, okay, sorry. I, I, even like how, it's not just like how the, you know, the mm -hmm. window is documented and recreated or presented, yeah. or then even like the <coughs> frame, it's even like you've written like 12 biographies, yeah. like you're framing people actually mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, oh, and of course, uh, I mean, if you're a filmmaker, you're always making a frame and then the first question you should ask is what are you leaving out because you're only, can, you know, what the screen space is one thing, but uh, immediately you're, you're uh, making an edit when you, when you, and, when you and, frame something. And maybe this is where you're talking about the outsider, I mean. This yeah, is yeah. That negative space you were talking about in your paintings as well, I think. The, yeah. The inter interesting thing about, win I mean, windows are very interesting because you, it defines inside and out and it's a way to be inside and experience outside at the same time. And uh, Kaczynski now lives, uh, he's imprisoned in a supermax prison in, in Florence, Colorado, and he's in a cell that's ironically 10 feet by 12 feet, which is the dimensions of his cabin. Um, and, but he does, he has windows, but they're at the top and they're recessed on an angle that let light in and they're at the top of the eight foot ceiling or whatever it is, so he can't look out. So it's a different, it's a spilling of light in, but no way of looking out, which is not the way windows actually work. So the, <coughs> in a, it, I, I've, it's, a, it's ironic, I think, to, that he would end up that way, you know, to, with light coming in, but no way to, to go out. And uh, the interesting thing about him is that from his life, he's li lived outside of society his whole life, and 
um, Julie Alt and I are trying to get him to not just write about technology but and the evils of technology, but to actually write about his life as somebody who's been isolated outside of society and his experiences of, of solitude, uh, uh, and kind of the other side of, of him. Um, so, but he is, he's, he's in the prison and we, we wrote him about uh, his sense of time in the prison. I made a film in the uh, mid 80s, I guess, 80, 87, uh, about a woman in prison. And I visited her and she was in for murder and I visited her for, for about 15 straight months. And her sense of time was so different than mine. Um, but Kaczynski said uh, he didn't have that, he didn't react to time that way because he didn't have enough time because he, he was so busy writing now and he has 10 people researching for him on the outside because he has no access to a library or, or to uh, internet or anything like that. So through the mails, people do research for him and, and send him that. And so he's, even within this uh, awful situation, of which he created, of course, for himself, uh, uh, he's, he's found an autonomy within that, which is kind of remarkable. And I think that comes from the fact that his whole life was focused on trying to find autonomy. Uh, so it, there's a strange kind of irony there uh, that, that's happening. Uh, should we quit? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank James Winnie. Thank thanks. you so much for thank really, you. really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.